So thank you uh, for that great introduction. And I have this sort of Herculean task now of trying to contextualize, I think, some of the best, most thoughtful, and most groundbreaking speakers I've ever sort of had a chance to share a meeting with. So uh, it's, it's sort of an honor to do that and an honor to have your time. Um, I want to start, before I get into my slides, with just something I've been reflecting on a little bit over the course of the day, which is uh, the ritual of Thanksgiving in the United States. That, uh, you know, a couple weeks from now, all of us Americans are all going to, you know, get, go to airports, crowd the roads, uh, basically travel at pretty much the worst time of the year, just as the rain and the snow is getting bad. And we're going to do this so that we can go uh, cook a turkey for about 10 hours. Now, if you have eaten turkey or if you've tried to prepare a turkey, it's just about the stupidest thing in the world that you can possibly do. Uh, turkey is almost impossible to make taste good. If you really work hard at it and a really good cook, you can, um, you can make it taste like a decent chicken, basically. Um, so on the one hand, it's this incredibly irrational thing to be doing with your time. Uh, and when you think about all of the time and resources that we as Americans put into this, it's, it's sort of insane. And then on the other hand, you think about it and it's, you, know, you, you get to spend time with your family. You dust off these sort of old recipes that have been you know, handed down from generation to generation. You have the little kids, the little cousins get to know each other. So there's on the one hand this very sort of technological and scientific basis of food that we really need to get our heads around because so much is changing. But there's also this really big emotional intimate component to food that is likewise transforming and, and will remain central to how we go about making decisions, how we go about figuring out what we want to eat. And the task really, I think, for understanding this broad future of food is to keep both of those viewpoints in mind and synthesize and look across both what's changing but what what do people want to not change? What's likely to be stable? So I have a bunch of slides, and as you'll see, uh, this work we did, Seeds of Disruption, was really an effort to synthesize across a lot of different fields and look at some of the most big picture innovations taking place. And so some of what you'll be seeing me show are, are things that you've already heard a little bit about, but hopefully I can build a little bit more scaffolding and context for how they fit into the food system. Uh, but just to start, let's see if I can get this. So, a little bit about us, just the very quick Institute for the Future. We're founded in 1968, a nonprofit based out in Silicon Valley, San Francisco area. Our job is to help people think better, more systematically about the future in order to make better decisions in the present. Uh, we do this in technology, food, health, global business, and then we also do sort of training to help people sort of get this kind of lens of futures oriented thinking. Um, I was told I should just do this then. So we work with a whole bunch of big Fortune 500s, branches of the government, that kind of thing. Uh, the key differentiator between the kind of research that I do and a lot of traditional academic research is that it's much more about synthesizing across fields. I'm obviously not an expert on all of these things. What I'm an expert in doing is helping people see connections that they otherwise wouldn't see. And that's really what we try to do. Uh, so to do this, we use this process we call foresight to insight to action. And uh, as Michelle mentioned, uh, hopefully that this talk will kind of bridge some of this big exploration of the future that we've been doing and start to bridge into insight. What is the threat or the opportunity or the key thing that you need to take back from this session and start messaging out to the rest of your company, to the rest of your colleagues, so that you can start the ball, ball moving toward action in a more sort of sustainable, uh, well thought out way. Uh, you'll notice we use the word foresight and not prediction. It's a bit of a kind of small distinction, but one that I find to be very important. Uh, my job is not to be able to send you an email 10 years from now to tell you that I was right. Uh, it's nice if I can do that. Hopefully I'll be able to do that, and usually our track record is very good at being able to do that. But I, we want to be evaluated more on how do we help you think about the world as it's changing so that you can work more effectively in the present. So that's kind of how I want you to think about this talk. Um, so just a few other sort of contexts for thinking about this work and, and for what we use for doing this research on the future of food. Uh, when you look across a lot of different uh, domains within the food system, whether it's production, distribution, manufacturing, uh, shopping, even our eating habits, there was this core theme that we kept coming into over and over again, which is that we're hitting limits. That the core strategies that we've used over the years that we've kind of relied on for 50, 100 years to get things done seem to be running into some pretty hard limits. Uh, this is data from the Council for um, Sustainable Agriculture. It's a, it's a couple years old now. 
But what it's showing is that based on their best case projections, so their best case projection is that green line. The, the food demand is the blue line on top. Their best case projection is we will not be able to produce enough food to meet demand. Their sort of low case scenarios, as you can see, are much, much worse and much scarier. So that's kind of one input we had into this work, is that there are these big limits that we seem to be running into. But the other thing to know about this, and, and this is sort of how we approach thinking about the future, is there are no future facts. That that's a really actually an empowering statement when you think about the future. There's nothing that we can know for sure about the future. But what we do like to look for is this idea that the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Uh, that's a, this is a quote from science fiction author William Gibson, and it's one that you'll hear a lot in this kind of futures work or innovation work. And you can see, in other words, someone like Mark, whose work on in vitro meat is just so groundbreaking. It's, for us, a little interesting signal of an unevenly distributed future. It's work that five, seven years ago was happening pretty under the radar in a lab and is now really sort of beginning to emerge in a big way. But it indicates something about how we sort of might start to approach this world. Is we're looking for these little pockets of innovation that point to bigger things that could scale. Uh, so just one example, and this really builds on, on some of what you've already seen, but I think it's kind of a worthwhile video to take a look at for an example of a signal. The San Francisco Bay Area is known as an incubator of innovation. The newest idea that came out of the Bay Area is revolutionizing the world's broken food system. This band of young scientists and culinary whiz kids is figuring out how to use plants to take the place of eggs in cooking. Their goal is to make one of the most unhealthy, costly, and environmentally damaging industries in the food world obsolete. So our approach here is let's take the animal, the greenhouse gas emissions, the cages, out of the equation and replace it with a plant. What's the, uh, what are you gonna do here? I'm gonna scramble the uh, world's first plant-based egg. Okay. Now hold on a second. Okay. That's a very big eye. I just want to soak that in for a second. All right, now I'm ready. It's one thing to mix a plant-based egg within other ingredients. It's quite another to eat a plant-based egg all by itself. You're close. No wonder you're so excited. I mean, this is so hard. I mean, this is, this is the hardest thing. No doubt. No yeah, doubt. This is definitely the hardest thing. Yeah, you're close. So that's a, this is a video of a, it's a, an American food critic by the name of Andrew Zimmern. And it's, uh, he's interviewing there the founders of a company called Hampton Creek Foods. It's gotten a lot of attention for doing um, various egg replacements. And this is sort of their effort at creating eggs without the need for chickens. Uh, and as you can hear, they're very, very close, apparently, to recreating the taste in a way that can convince a food critic that this is a pretty good substitute. So for me, that's a pretty interesting signal to kind of go down this path of thinking about where things are headed and how, what we might have to respond to. Uh, so again, this is our model. And, and just one other sort of line of, of thinking and, and sort of why you, sh you know, why, the, how you can sort of start to take this kind of big picture thinking and, and, and operationalize it and work with it. Uh, so why do 10-year forecasting? Uh, one is that you can identify early experiments and innovations in the environment and the external landscape that, you have, that have the potential to scale. Uh, I think we've heard about a lot of these today, but a lot of traditional competitive analyses and things of that nature, you'll find the other brands and the other businesses that are roughly your size or a little bit smaller or a little bit bigger, and then you can kind of figure out what they're doing and you've, you know, you've done your competitive analysis. Uh, but the thing that you miss is that there's somebody with a very small amount of money now who's working on something that has the potential to be very big. And so one of the things that you can get from this kind of work is a sense of where do you need to be paying attention to going forward. Um, another one is you gain perspective on potential threats and opportunities that are just outside the normal planning horizon. Uh, we use 10, year, 10 years as our mark um, in large part because it gives you, you know, most organizations three to five years are the normal planning cycles. Ten years gives you enough distance that you can gain some perspective on it, but it's still close enough in to be relevant and practical to act on. Uh, you know, thousand-year forecasting is extremely interesting to me, but most businesses are not going to make thousand-year plans, so it's very hard to really work with that. Um, a third is that you gain clarity about long-term directions of change, and that's really what I'm interested in, is understanding those long-term directions of change and how to work with them. 
And then finally, this is a quote from Warren Buffett that I like quite a lot, which is that it's better to be approximately right than precisely wrong. Uh, and what I like about that is there's sort of this, um, I think, mindset that what we want are really well, you know, well-developed models and, and sort of really quantitatively driven models that can show us this is what we think exactly will happen at this time. And that's, you know, I, I, there's nothing wrong with that. There's extreme, you know, extraordinary amounts of value in that. But what I'm trying to do is figure out approximately what's changing because I think that's probably more useful over a 10-year time horizon than being precise but wrong. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do here. Uh, so just for instance, and this is, it picks up on themes you've already heard. If you think just on a 10-year time horizon, it's really obvious sensors will be everywhere. We've heard a number like a trillion sensors, give or take, will be in the world in 10 years. So sensors will be everywhere. They'll be just incredibly cheap. They'll be connected to each other. And they'll be in our bodies. So that's pretty easy. That's pretty straightforward, actually, when you do a 10-year forecast. And then you can begin to think about what does this mean about, let's say, health management and how we need to think about food consumers in the future. If you look one year, I think the story and how you would really act on it is a little bit less clear. It's, you know, we'll have more sensors at some level. They'll be somewhat cheaper. And they'll kind of be communicating with each other. So there's not as much to act on, there's not as much grounding, and so you can't really get the overall sweep of change on that shorter term time horizon. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move into sharing a little bit of um, sort of snapshots of our work, Seeds of Disruption. And again, you'll see those on your um, tables, They're these kind of big visuals there. Um, and, and the overall argument, again, is that this idea um, sort of twofold. Um, you know, so we looked at the food system and really tried to divide it up into these sort of five or these five areas: uh, production, distribution, manufacturing, shopping, and eating. And look for all of the different sort of early innovations, things taking place in labs, things that scientists are doing. Look for all the little discrete pockets of change to try to understand what are the big disruptive forces that are reshaping our food environment. Uh, so the core argument here, or the basic kind of framework here is that the core strategies that we've been using within the food system are facing some pretty big fundamental limits over the next decade. Uh, but that's kind of the bad news. And the good or bad news, depending on your perspective, is that a series of you know, technology disruptions are really giving us the opportunity to remake the future of food and reinvent how we go about doing things within the food system. Uh, one of the things you'll note in, in, is that this is sort of, it's, it's visual, but it's not, um, the, each, each component of this map is sort of not the same size and kind of is, is designed with a sort of jagged nature because part of the argument here is that when you really take a full systems view, the relationship between things like production and eating, say farmer to consumer, is changing. And so part of what we need to do is understand these as discrete categories, but also understand that the relationships between all of the different facets of the system are changing. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share these, these, these highlights. And again, um, you know, as questions arise, please, please, please interrupt, please share them. Uh, so for production, we know that the core strategy within production is intensification. That, that more and more, you know, for many, many years, you could even say centuries, millennia, the core strategy has been how do we get more efficiency, more production out of the same amount of land. And there's nothing wrong with that, and it's not necessarily going away, but that we're going to have to think about intensification and think about the ways we use land in, from somewhat different perspectives. In part, this is because of this disruption that Mark shared, I think, so brilliantly of the transforming nature of protein and the different ways that we're going about producing, or producing protein and figuring out how to get it to the end consumer. Uh, so just a couple visuals of this. Thomas mentioned earlier, um, vertical farming emerging, and that's definitely kind of been an ongoing trope over the years, and we're now finally starting to see it emerge. Um, Thomas also showed this video of uh, Plant Lab uh, based out in the Netherlands. I went back and I looked up the numbers on this, and, and what they're doing is pretty interesting stuff. So Plant Lab, uh, just for a little bit of additional context, it's, um, it's again, this is this um, sort of self-contained indoor facility where the idea and the effort is to automate all of the different elements of growing and producing uh, vegetables for consuming, you know, eventually for human consumption. Uh, you'll notice a few things about this. If you look, the light colors are red and purple. Uh, that's not because it's a bad photo. 
It's because they use red and purple and blue lights because plants seem to respond better to that than natural light. It's actually allowed the people behind this to pretty much full sale or wholesale reinvent all of the different ways that they might think about, understand, you know, create a greenhouse for food. Uh, so just kind of numerically what they're doing that's pretty interesting. They think that they're able to do, they think that, that when they get this up and running and full sale, uh, they'll be able to reduce water consumption growing in, going into these plants uh, by to 10% of current use. So by 90%, in other words. Uh, they believe that they're going to improve you know, uh, efficiency, essentially double it from 9% to 18% from photosynthetic conversion. So the people behind this are really, really convinced that this is a new direction for being able to grow food and that rather than being something that has to take place, let's say, on a farm, this is something you could put in an abandoned skyscraper. This is something that you could put in a building somewhere that's just not being put to use, a house, let's say. But that this potential here is to really remake our geography where food is not grown here and then distributed here, but where food is grown, distributed, consumed very, very close together. So that's part of what's changing here. Uh, I showed this video of Beyond Eggs, but it really gets us thinking, I think, very differently about the relationships we have with protein and the ways we, we're producing. Uh, I just want to show one other, and, and we, you know, we've seen so much and on synthetic meat already. Um, this is a veggie burger. So take that in for a second. This is an image of a veggie burger. Uh, it's being developed by some folks over at Stanford who've kind of since gone into private industry. The company is called Impossible Burger. Uh, when it's been taste tested, uh, journalists and other critics who have tasted it say it's pretty good. It's kind of as good as a turkey burger, not quite as good as a beef burger yet. Uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, um, the texture is kind of not there, that kind of thing, but it's you know, pr pretty close. Uh, they believe they're going to be able to release a commercial product sometime in the next year or two. But the thing I find kind of most interesting about this is Google recently tried to acquire Impossible Burger for about $500 million. And the folks behind this company turned them down. Which is kind of a crazy thing when you think about it. I work with a lot of food companies, and most food companies I work with if something's not a $1 billion brand, it's almost not, you know, it doesn't even sort of get the rounding error on the budget and you don't worry about it. A billion dollars is kind of sort of entry level brand with a lot of the food companies I work with. Uh, but to achieve being a billion dollar brand in the food industry means you have massive global sales and massive global operations. You are producing you know, millions, hundreds of millions of units. Uh, these folks have not sold a product yet. They've not, there's not an impossible burger on the market that you can go anywhere in the world and buy today. They've been taste tested by a few people, but they're not out in the world. Uh, but their valuation is almost more like a tech company than a food company. And I'm still kind of trying to get my head around that, but I think it says something very different and very interesting about the direction of change that's happening within the food system and sort of the ways we need to sort of shift our thinking from kind of the traditional economics of a food business toward more of the economics of something like a tech company or a science-based company. So pretty interesting from that regard. So we do these things called artifacts from the future. And again, you'll see these distributed around at your tables. Uh, so this is our depiction of what going to a high-end butcher might look like 10 or 15 years from now. So you see things like, of course, we have in vitro grown, lab-grown meat uh, that you know, has to be there. But you also see things like invasive species-based meat, uh, grassland rehab grazed meat, um, and grassland pasture-fed, grade-A roadkill, that one. There's a, there's a subculture of dieting in the US based on trying to make roadkill a food, uh, part, you know, part of the food chain, because if it's dead anyway, you might as well eat it. I don't, I don't know if that's going to take off, but it's kind of interesting. Um, but more the point here that we're trying to get across is that all of these different sources are likely to coexist, at least on a 10, 20 year time horizon. That things like in vitro meat will coexist with pasture fed meat. And not only will they coexist in the same uh, you know, butcher, in the same butcher shop, but they'll coexist in the same people or the same individual. That at sometimes I might be the kind of consumer who says, I want the in vitro meat because it's the most efficient, it's the best for the environment. But then when I have that special dinner with family, maybe I really do want the pasture fed beef for some reason.
but that we're going to have to sort of shift our mindsets toward away from thinking of sort of binaries or black and whites around this space toward a world where all of these different values are going to coexist for a while. So that's our first sort of pass through this world of, of um, production. And again, you know, the argument, sort of the meta-level argument is that these relationships between these five areas are all sort of undergoing change now. But the next one I want to share, the next area I want to share is distribution. And this is, um, this is a space where what you see here is not a shift so much in efficiency because the drive toward efficiency is not going to go away, but a shift in the idea of closed efficiency. So, you know, open source, open innovation, these are kind of terms we're all pretty familiar with, more in San Francisco, more in my area, I think, than here necessarily. But this idea of sort of moving from closed systems to open systems is kind of taken hold, but isn't is nearly as involved, particularly in distribution, I think, as it could be. And it's opening up entirely new ways of doing different kinds of interesting innovation. So just a few kind of background slides on this. Uh, a couple years ago, some art students in California put together this really interesting uh, project they called the Taco Shed pro Project. And their basic goal was to deconstruct the um, sort of trade routes behind all of the different ingredients that went into a taco that they got from a taco truck. Uh, so they found things like foil traveled this far from Chile and av avocado came in from here and you know, there, there were some kind of weird things where things that they thought would be from far away were close and, and so on or things were more or less efficient. But when you actually take a step back from what they were describing, they were describing really a trade and distribution network that looked a lot like this where there are kind of uh, decentralized or distributed producers, uh, kind of, you know, sort of decentralized nodes that route things, but that were kind of based in this sort of model of a hub and spoke model. And for us, uh, at Institute for the Future, it reminded us of this uh, now very old diagram here. So one of our founders, a guy by the name Paul Barron, uh, was one of the people behind a technology called packet switching technology. Packet switching technology is kind of a clunky term, but it means something really important for the world, something most of us don't think anything about. It's that you can route information uh, in you know, where it needs to go, and if a node in a network breaks down, you can just bypass that network and go in a different direction. So when Paul was doing this work, uh, you know, we were more in this era of centralized networks where you kind of had to route things through central spaces, and then you had to get it back out. Uh, his sort of argument was we'd, you know, at the time we had sort of started to move to decentralized systems. But what he really posited was that we should think about not decentralized systems, but distributed networks, where things can just sort of automatically route to where they need to be. Uh, for those of you who are wondering what the paper on distributed communications is about, it's about this technology called packet switching, which is the underlying technology that we use to get information across the internet. His point was, if we can just break out of this need for nodes to block things, we can all sort of communicate much more efficiently and much more effectively. So what's changing here? And what's the relationship between a communications network and thinking about food distribution? You may be wondering that. Uh, so, oops, I've got to go back to this guy. So, I find it really interesting to think about this in the context of something like Uber. Uber's now, as I, as I understand, I just I was looking this up last night, I guess Uber just did its one millionth ride here in New Zealand. When did Uber get here? Six months ago? Nine months ago? I was trying to figure that out. Very, very recently, right? It's sort of actually kind of one of those amazing tech stories of, of at least the last decade of how this company has gone from not existing five years ago to being something like a $50 billion company today that's in you know, many countries all over the world. Um, but Uber, you know, it's known as a ride service. I pick up my phone, I press a button, somebody with a car comes, they take me somewhere, you know, that, that's the interaction. Um, but what they've already started doing is experimenting with food delivery. And in the long run, what they, and not, they, not just them, but a lot of folks like Uber see themselves as doing as being essentially um, you know, essentially a physical service for moving goods around the same way and with the same level of efficiency that our internet networks move people or move information around in this sort of distributed way. That, 
in effect, I can press a button and just as easily as an Uber driver can come pick me up, he can pick up a burrito or a taco or whatever it might be and drop it off and in the process pick up another person and just kind of go around in this path of distributing physical goods just as, you know, in that same sort of distributed manner. So it points to this kind of different shift where we need to start thinking about uh, distribution in this sort of open-ended way where we're not sort of, we don't have closed models for distribution but, um, but we're really much more sort of open about it. Another example of this is something um, called Food Hub. And my tagline here is Match.com for food, but I, I don't know, that may be too like generationally old. Maybe it should be Tinder for food or something like that. Um, but the basic idea of this is that, uh, it's a, that, that in many cases, one of the big challenges that small scale producers have is in reaching consumers on the other side and figuring out how do I match supply and demand. And so they have to go through middlemen, kind of become commoditized, or, or sort of any quality that they might put into the system gets kind of eroded because they sort of get brought into the larger system. So what Food Hub's value proposition is, and they're, they're working in the US and they've been trying to sort of improve this, is to make it easy for me as an end user or an end consumer, if I want a particular kind of coffee, let's say, with particular kinds of growing conditions, particular kinds of inputs that meet X value system that I have and you happen to grow and produce coffee in that way, they're trying to make it really easy for us to find each other and essentially cut out a lot of the, the, the sort of infrastructure in place right now that is essentially a middleman between me and the farmer. So it's, I think, really sort of starting to reshape uh, those relationships. At the same time, it's opening up this kind of platform that anybody who's producing food can get onto and sort of start to interact more effectively. Uh, and finally, I think it's really interesting to look at a company like Coke and see what they're doing in terms of their distribution networks. So anywhere in the world you are, I think, I think this is kind of a fascinating thing, anywhere in the world you are, you can get a Coke. I've been in very rural places where you, you know, where there's like, you know, almost no running water, almost no electricity, Cokes. Everywhere. And it's just kind of the world that we're in. Coke has built out one of the most amazing distribution systems in the world. Uh, so to me, it's really telling to think about this space that Coke has started doing this thing called Cola Life, where they've recognized that you see there, and it's, it's hard to see, it's very small, uh, that there's a little bit of air in the uh, cartons that they use to distribute Coke all over the world. And in that little space of air, they can pack medicine. So that now if you're in one of these parts of the rural world where you just have no access to medicine, no access to health, no, you, know, you, you really need this kind of distribution network where they're sort of packaging these two things together. Um, you, you can sort of you know, judge, not judge what you think about Coke, uh, packaging medicine next to Coke, uh, maybe not the healthiest beverage in the world, but I think it's just a really telling example of how people are starting to think about opening up distribution systems in a, sort of these new fluid ways. Uh, so a couple, you know, we, again, this, our model is foresight to insight to action. And so just a couple kind of key takeaways that I would have for thinking about this space. Um, one, we're starting to see barriers to entry um, and, and sort of barriers to scaling are declining uh, in a very rapid way. And what that means is that the landscape for food is being reshaped very, very quickly, much faster than in previous years. Uh, and I think, quite honestly, you, know, you look at the life cycles in technology systems and technology products, the more technology gets built into our food system, I think the more that this, is going, this dynamic is going to continue to play out. So I think these barriers to entry are going to continue to get lower and lower, and I think it will be easier and easier for folks with really interesting, innovative stuff to scale quickly. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I'm, I've followed Mark's work for years in part because I'm just so excited about the potential for these new kinds of production methods uh, to alleviate hunger, to alleviate health issues, but to really transform and, and really help us address a lot of the very big problems in the world. Uh, so to me, that's just a really interesting space and one that there's still a lot of opportunity to get behind of figuring out how to sort of turn this into a product in a way that is really helping people in a big way in their lives. Um, finally, shifts in value and c culture around natural. I mean, so I think this last point, 
here is that we're starting to see again this sort of emergence of this kind of both and consumer, this sort of, you know, this kind of consumer who's willing to kind of take on a lot of different viewpoints all at once and sort of embody and almost own their hypocrisy. Uh, so, you know, we have a ton of uh, startups over in the San Francisco area who are all doing these variations on, you know, milk without cows, uh, you know, eggs without chickens, uh, beef without cows, that kind of thing. And when folks I come, folks I work with who come to the Bay Area, one of the, their big questions is always, you know, I don't understand the, the, the 20 year olds who want everything to be organic and natural and sort of sustainable and hate GMOs are the same exact people who are most fired up about eating in vitro meat. And I actually don't think that's a contradiction. I think for a lot of people it feels intuitively like a contradiction. But in many ways there I think in part it's, in part it's the value system. I think in part it just feels much more sustainable. And I think in part it feels like people are putting them into different cognitive buckets. That at some level something that's created in such a different way is almost an entirely different kind of food experience or food system or food, um, you know, food experience. But I think the broader point here is that, again, as you think about this world, I think it's really, really important to think about these consumers as sort of both and consumers and not as sort of a world of discrete segments that don't change. Okay, so that gets us kind of through these first two areas of production and distribution. Uh, just kind of continuing on, and, and I'm not going through the exact linear supply chain in part because this is not a precisely linear argument. Um, so next I'm going to shopping. And shopping is interesting to me. I've, I spend a lot of time thinking about shopping and just working with folks on shopping. The core of shopping here has been centralization. And so this is the big innovation of about 1910, 1920 give or take, depending on, um, depending on which photo it is. But this is the big innovation of 100 years ago, essentially. It was the supermarket. And what could you do at the supermarket? You could buy just about anything that you wanted. Um, and that's been essentially the core strategy of food retail for, I mean, you could go a lot further back than the supermarket, but let's say for at least 100 years, but you could certainly argue for a much longer period of time, is that let's centralize everything I can walk down the aisles, get my apples, my eggs, my milk, my beef. I can go home. It's convenient, kind of all in one trip. That's sort of the model. Uh, but we think that this is, again, a space that's on the verge of changing, which, before I get there, there's an interesting video that'll give you some sense of why I think this might be changing. Do we have any milk? <laughs> People are never really sure if they have milk. You think you have milk? We might have. I know there's a carton in there. I don't know how much is in there. Well, what should we do? Because you want to be sure. There's nothing worse than thinking you have milk and not having it. You know, you got the bowl set up, the cereal, the spoon, the napkin, the TV, the newspaper, everything's ready to go. You gotta lift up the carton and it's too light. Ah! Oh no! Too light. Or sometimes you think you need milk. Hey, we better pick up some milk. Like many of you are thinking right now. <laughs> you know, he's right. Maybe we should pick up some milk. <laughs> so you'll pick up some milk on the way home. And then you'll discover you already had milk. And now you got way too much milk. That's no good either. Now it's a race against the clock with the expiration date. <laughs> that freaky thing. Now you're eating giant punch bowls of cereal, three meals a day. You're washing your face with milk bringing cats in from all over the neighborhood. Hurry up and drink it! Come on, it's almost time! <laughs> so, I like that. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's always good to have Jerry Seinfeld and, you know, always kind of good insight about the world. Uh, what I think is useful just to remember, and, and this is U.S. data, but it's very telling, um, is that this kind of sort of funny dynamic of, oh, do I have too much, do I not have enough, and then you kind of, the food gets pushed to the back and you forget about it, back to the refrigerator, is actually a really big deal. Um, this is, again, this is U.S. data, but the basic finding from the USDA is that something like $166 billion are lost in food waste every year. Now, some of that's obviously in shipping. I mean, there's kind of various. There's, it'd be easy if there was one cause of the problem. It'd be an easy problem to solve. The challenge is that there's not one single cause. 
Uh, but the estimate is something like 14% is just at home when people are not paying attention to it. And so when you think about it, it's a, it's a really fairly big amount that gets lost just because we're kind of not paying attention or because you know, it kind of got pushed to the back of the refrigerator when you bought something else and you forgot about it. Um, but that's actually a really big waste problem. That's a really sort of big mess. Um, so this, again, I think is a, a space that's really interesting to me and a space that I think is going to change pretty rapidly. And if I had to bet, I'd say this space is probably going to change more quickly than many of the other spaces because it's so infused with consumer technology and not necessarily basic science or basic biology. But what we're calling it is grocery shopping without the store. And at some level, this is actually a really boring forecast because how many of you bought something online in the last year? So it's a really boring forecast, right? We're all buying things online. That's not new. Um, but for a variety of reasons, it's been really, really hard to take that basic dynamic and move it into the food system. Most of us basically buy almost all of our food through this process of going to the A&P or going to whatever your local supermarket is, going through the aisles and picking it up. So a few ways this is changing. I've been disappointed that Starbucks has not rolled this out yet. Uh, they, talk, they were talking about doing this in 2013. They were like, we are going to make it we're going to partner with car companies so that you can order coffee through your car's dashboard. Uh, they've not done this yet. But I think the fact that they're experimenting or putting resources into just testing this out and seeing if this is a thing that people would pay for and want to work with is very telling of where they see the direction of change headed here. That the direction of change is not, I go to the Starbucks, I go into line, I wait for the person, I order the thing, I wait for the thing to be made, and then I go home. The direction of change is, I'm going to Starbucks, I know what I want, I send them a message through some sort of device, by the time I get there, Starbucks has my drink for me. That's really the direction of change, and if you think about the value proposition for the end consumer, that's pretty good. You just saved me 10 minutes, and I still get the drink I want. And you probably made everybody's lives easier, you'll probably sell more, and so on. So that feels to me whether or not you get it through your car, or through your phone, or through some other mechanism, it's pretty obvious that that's a direction of change here. Um, I also think that this from Amazon is probably very telling about how things are changing here. So um, Amazon, they've, they've gotten a lot of um, press recently in the United States for this announcement around their Dash system. Uh, the sort of first iteration of this are little magnetic buttons that you stick all around your house. Uh, they're $5, the buttons. And then when you press them, uh, you have a predetermined order and it just sends Amazon the information that you put in the order and then a day or two later, somebody will drop off an Amazon package at your house for you. Um, the idea of this is pretty simple. Uh, many of us have lots of purchases that we want to make on an ongoing basis. Uh, we don't necessarily want to go to the store for them. We'd kind of like them to be simple. I have a one and a half year old daughter and for me it makes a lot of sense that I would have a button next to the changing table where I just press diapers and then some fairy bring, brought me diapers. A, a day later I just don't want to run out of diapers. There's no too many diapers problem in my life that I could have. Um, so that's pretty interesting. But what I think is actually more interesting is the part of the announcement that hasn't gotten nearly as much attention, which is that they have this sort of dash replenishment API. So an API, something called an application programming interface, is a very simple mechanism whereby two, you know, essentially two data systems can talk to each other and interact with each other. Uh, so what Amazon is doing is they're developing an API that appliance manufacturers can stick into the appliances themselves and then automatically reorder whatever it is the appliance needs through Amazon. You don't need to think at all about it. Uh, so what's pictured there is one of the early prototypes, a Brita water filter, which uh, is you know, just a standard water filter, filters out minerals and so on. Um, when the filter start, stops working as well, the system knows and it orders a new filter for you from Amazon. You don't ever need to think about it. Uh, you've already made your decision to buy a Brita and so more filters is kind of a no-brainer. You can shut it off if you want to. But to me, this is a really clear direction of change for these kinds of sort of basic uh, commodity purchases that I don't want to think about this stuff, so why am I spending time going to the store when this can just essentially be automated in my life? 
so uh, we saw Greg showed, and this should be if you can turn the volume down on this, uh, we, saw, we saw a really great uh, presentation about the future of robotics. Uh, it just kind of goes without saying that you could stick a person in a self-driving car uh, who's driving. You could also just, you know, have the self-driving car without a person delivering stuff, just if you want to think about it that way. Uh, we also saw drones. You can also sort of, again, think about um, how do you use drones, particularly I'm very interested in using drones uh, in the context of, of emerging markets in places that are not connected through traditional infrastructure. Uh, a really great company by the name of Matternet out in the Bay Area in San Francisco is essentially, that's what a video, that video is of, is of them trying to use drones to deliver medicine uh, in ways that bypass uh, places that don't have traditional road infrastructure. So you can use that for medicine, but you can also use that obviously for food and food shopping. Uh, so to me, it sort of highlights this world where we're going to be shopping in pretty different ways and our ability to kind of get things in a much more sort of open, distributed way is emerging. And where this idea that I go to the central retailer anytime I need food, that may not hold or probably won't hold nearly as much in the future. So again, we do these artifacts from the future. Uh, this, is, this is sort of a depiction of a self-driving car somewhere in Brazil. And you can see that What's actually happening here is that the drone delivery is being delayed so that the person can be home to meet the drone. Uh, if, if you've spent any time in Brazil, you know there's a lot of crime there and a lot of fear of crime. And so part of the, the backstory to this is that the person doesn't want the food dropped off at his house so it doesn't get stolen from him. Uh, but the kind of the overall story here is to, that we can sort of start to think about food shopping, food ordering in this kind of on-demand way where things get routed almost seamlessly to where we need them. Now, one other point here, and this is a book that maybe some of you have read. It's, it's kind of very popular in, in, in business circles in the United States, particularly with consumer goods companies, called The Experience Economy. And it's now, I'd say, 20 years old in that neighborhood. And the point of including this is a couple things. So th their basic argument is as follows. that you know, that, that is a business you can sell commodities, um, what it was, commo you can sell products, services, and experiences, and then sort of at the highest level, transformations. And if you're just selling products, you get commoditized. If you're selling services, you, there's some profit there. And then the higher up you go toward experiences, the more profit you can make. Uh, that, that's kind of the basic model that they're working with. And the reason I think it's worth just thinking about and including this in this space is that I don't think this is a future where we just all sit around in our houses and never leave as Amazon's drones you know, drop things off in our houses and we occasionally kind of go outside to sort of pick up the order or whatever. Um, you know, the, the, most of us uh, want to leave the house. That's fun. We like interacting with each other. We like getting out into the world. We like sunshine. We like other people. Uh, so I don't think shopping is going away. But I think if your business is premised on making, you know, on just selling a commodity product that can be shipped in a different way, I think that's going to be a very hard business to be in in the food world. But I think there's a lot of opportunity in creating really cool food experiences. And I don't think that's going away anytime soon. So that's kind of how I would start to think about this space. So just a couple key insights. Um, you know, everywhere becomes a store and a battleground for marketing and engagement. Um, I've worked with a lot of companies that have you know, consumer market insights and shopper market insights, and there's sort of this bifurcation almost of what's the information I'm getting at home versus what's the information I'm getting in the store and how do I... I think that that whole model is probably needs to be retired and that you need to just sort of start to think about this as a world where you're continually engaging with people and how do you sort of design interactions for a world where you're continually engaging with people. But I think that's what you need to be thinking about. Um, one of our past presidents, one of my mentors at IFTF, wrote a book called Get There Early. Um, get there early is not first mover advantage, and that's actually a, a useful distinction. Um, there are a lot of first movers who are too early, or they don't have enough money to bring the thing all the way along, and then they get kind of killed by a bigger competitor. It's not necessarily bad to be a first mover, but it's not always necessary to be a first mover. The point, though, is that getting there early will be really essential for an automated purchase. So once I have that Brita filter in my home that's automatically reordering the filters, it's very, very hard to get in between that relationship. That's going to be very, very hard. So getting there early in this space is really critical. 
And I think if you're late, in many instances, you'll be cut out. And then I think, again, this is this final point. I think experiences still matter. Um, this can be very broadly defined. It includes what is the origin of the food? Uh, who's growing it? What's the branding? What's the story behind it? Uh, experiences here doesn't just mean I go to a really cool restaurant where there's a really nice view and there's good music and you know, there's a really high-end chef. I mean, that's great and I'll pay money for that, of course. But I think experiences here really need to be thought about in this sort of holistic way and that, um, you know, for, you know, for instance, among the beef producers here, that there are opportunities to really define a clear story and a clear experience of beef that, might, you know, that, that could help you sort of break through in this world. So just something to be thinking about. So, um, manufacturing. So this is kind of our fourth of this you know, five tiered area. And for manufacturing, the core strategy has always been, or not always, but uh, the sort of core logic of manufacturing is standardization. So I guess it has always been in many ways standardization. That you know, if you go back and you look at, you know, at Henry Ford or any of those sort of early industrial pioneers, the basic idea was take a complex process, you know, basically a complex process, break it down into component parts, standardize the execution of those things, and then create a standardized product. That's manufacturing in a nutshell, right? Um, what's interesting to me is that manu food manufacturing has gotten so good that it's actually in many ways better than what really high-end chefs can do sometimes. Uh, I'm always fascinated. I'd say about once a year, maybe once a, every couple of years, I, you know, but every once in a while you'll see these stories where some you know, superstar Michelin star chef person has decided that they're going to make McDonald's french fries and they you know, put a lot of effort into it and they put a lot of, and they kind of hand do it. And then food critics will say, this is good, almost like McDonald's, which is kind of interesting because you know, ordinarily this is the sort of person you'd spend $200 to have him make you dinner. And what he can do, he can do a lot of things, but what he can't do is make french fries that taste as good as the McDonald's french fries that you get. And it's because I think we've had sort of this massive, massive investment of capital and resources and, and intellectual you know, uh, endeavors into figuring out how do we create sort of the best, most optimal, most delicious, mass-produced food product. Um, so again, I think that this is starting to change. And I think that this will change in part because of some of the things like 3D printing and some of these other things that we've started to been discussing here today that um, they're creating opportunities to take the sort of uh, logic of mass production and logic of manufacturing and sort of bring it down to a local level where you can still m sort of get the benefits of manufacturing but also get some more of the benefits of customization. So just one example, it's Keurig's kind of interesting because Keurig went through this massive wave of excitement you know, two, three years ago in the United States and has now gone through this sort of massive drop off in excitement uh, because they put digital rights management tools on their coffee pods, which is a kind of weird backstory. Um, but before they kind of did that, one of the things they were experimenting with and are continuing to experiment with is this idea that they could think of this coffee maker not as a coffee maker, but really as sort of a platform, as an appliance that any uh, major manufacturer of food could sort of plug their little you know, pod into and create different kinds of foods. So this is uh, something that Campbell's and Keurig was part were partnering on a couple of years ago. And I, I don't think it's really taken off too much, but th they were looking at this idea of creating essentially Campbell's soup for your Keurig so that you could put in that little pod and instead of getting a hot coffee or a hot tea, you'd just get a hot chicken noodle soup. Uh, it's kind of interesting. And again, the point isn't so much that this is successful or not successful, but the point is the logic shift that's taking place here, that they're starting to think about the appliances in, that they put into people's homes as platforms that other people can innovate on. And I think that's really kind of the big shift in manufacturing, is this sort of idea of local platforms that people can work with. So a couple other examples. Um, Coke has done, again, some really interesting work with their Coke Freestyle. Uh, these are, have been now rolled out a lot to the United States, and the basic idea is to use hyper-concentrated syrups uh, and local water sources so that you can create something like 100 different 
uh, soda varieties without the need to ship nearly as much water, which shipping water with flavoring in it is not necessarily very efficient. So for them, it's a big sustainability play. Uh, the other thing that they're really, that's interesting about what they're looking at is that they're looking at using this as a tool to build water purification devices uh, in emerging markets and in places that don't have access to uh, pure water. So they're kind of doing this sort of interesting kind of two-level thing of, of creating a product or creating a, a platform for, for soda that's more efficient in the markets that they're already established, but potentially can allow them to gain entrance into new markets faster and more effectively. Um, and then finally, I think this is just worth looking at. Uh, this is a company out in the Bay Area uh, that's working on a hamburger making uh, robot. Um, they're little, uh, they're pretty much in stealth mode. They did a little bit of press and then sort of backed out of the press. So they're, they're kind of a little cagey on the details of this. But the company's name is Momentum Machines. And at the time that they were talking about this, uh, what, what their original claim was is they could do 400 burgers per hour uh, which is well over lunchtime demand. Uh, if I wanted a 30% chicken, 20% beef, 50% lamb burger for some reason, that would be a terrible burger. Don't have that burger. Uh, but if you wanted that burger, you could have it made. If you wanted 50-50 lamb and beef, you could have it made. Uh, you could get it cooked to the exact temperature that you wanted it. You could get the ingredients sliced, and it would do it supposedly uh, faster, more efficiently, and cheaper than human cooks. Um, Again, they're now kind of backing off some of these claims, but I think the point to be thinking about is that something like this, whether it's this or something like this, is going to be pretty practical and pretty feasible over the next few years, and that we're going to sort of start to be thinking about cooking in this sort of different way, in this kind of semi-automated way. So uh, one other artifact from the future, this is not included in the set that you have here, but this is uh, one we did a couple of years ago, and it, it remains one of my favorite. It's uh, the word fabricacia is, is a sort of mashup of the words for pharmacy and factory in Spanish, uh, fabrica and farmacia. And the tagline, comida es medicina, uh, food is medicine. But what you see here is somebody looking kind of at this kind of, uh, if you've spent any time in, in, in Mexico or, or parts of Latin, rural Latin America, you're kind of familiar with this sort of pharmacy models of sort of bodegas where people um, kind of go to. And this is somebody kind of in that sort of pharmacy bodega style place but at the same time, he's using a 3D printer to get food that's manufactured for him locally and on site. And that's kind of the story here. And I think what I want you to be thinking about and why I wanted to include this here is that in many cases, some of these technologies allow us to leapfrog traditional paths of development and traditional paths to get into markets that uh, many of us are used to kind of, you know, things follow a pattern you know, it worked in the US and so now it'll work in China and then after it works in China, something similar will work in India or what have you. Uh, but I think that model is changing and there's a lot of opportunities to say, how could we leapfrog traditional ways of doing things and get things better, faster, more efficiently to where they need to go? Okay, so a couple, a couple key insights. Um, so one, I think localized manufacturing accel accelerates opportunities to reach new markets. Again, that's, that's that artifact there, and I think for, for you guys it's just use, worth thinking about how can you use these new technologies that you've been hearing about to get into new markets faster, more effectively, more efficiently, better. Um, but I think we're gonna see a move from products to platforms, that people who can sort of create food platforms that others can innovate on top of have a real opportunity here. And that's kind of the core here. So, I'll keep going here through uh, kind of the last big disruption, which is eating. And I think eating is interesting in part because it's, again, it's something we do all the time. It's probably the most emotional part of the food uh, experience. You know, it's, it's embodied. Uh, it's kind of part of our daily lives. Uh, and at the same time, what we're seeing is consumers are gaining a much greater influence over the kinds of demands that they're placing on producers, distributors, manufacturers, and so on, that in many ways, um, What's interesting here is that even as there are all these new scientific breakthroughs that are enabling incredible new kinds of precision and innovation, there's at the same time this new force where consumers have much more influence and power over what's taking place. So uh, I think also there's a limit here around attention, motivation, and generally convenience. So this is a model uh, developed by BJ Fogg, who's a researcher at Stanford. And what I like about this is it's a very simple model for thinking about behavior change and thinking about decision making. His basic argument 
is almost mind-numbingly simple. Um, it's that if you want somebody to do something, you can do one of two things. You can make them extremely motivated to do something. This can be your most important thing in the world, and you will, you know, you'll drive for three hours, you'll spend a ton of money, whatever it is, you will do it because you are so motivated. You can make it extremely easy to do something, or you can do something in between, but that's how you get people to do things. Uh, in general, my really strong conviction is that we spend a lot of time thinking about motivation and a lot less time about thinking about how to make things easy, and that there's a massive, massive market opportunity in thinking about and creating ways to make things easy. So one simple example, I, I uh, started my career at Institute for the Future in our health group, and I've spent most of my career in health in one way or another, health and healthcare in one way or another. Uh, if you look at the recommendations from the American Diabetic Association about what somebody with diabetes needs to do to manage their diabetes, there's something like 26 specific recommendations. If you were to follow everything step by step throughout the course of your day, it would take you two full hours to follow those recommendations. The first recommendation on the list is eat well, which is actually not one thing, but many things that you need to do on an ongoing basis every day. And so if you think about, you know, we were talking earlier about personalized nutrition. If you're thinking about personalized nutrition and something like diabetes, which is one of the sort of biggest, most challenging diseases in the world and, and just getting worse and affecting more people, um, to me, it's not necessarily a motivation problem. Everyone wants to better manage their disease, or almost everyone, certainly. It's hard to do, right? And so I think that's the opportunity here, is how do you make things easy to do for people? So, um, so again, I think the core strategy here has been convenience. One other sort of interesting little factoid here is, you know, so there's this sort of interesting parallel that we've observed between the inventor of the sandwich and the inventor of the tuna roll. Uh, the, of course, the sandwich is invented by the Earl of Sandwich. Nobody exactly knows the name of the inventor of the tuna roll, but according to reports on both of them, both inventors were compulsive gamblers. And the reason that they created these foods was so that they could eat and gamble at the same time, which I think is a pretty interesting little fact about the two of them. Um, so, you know, that's kind of if you think about the on-the-go food or, food, you know, that kind of design for food, that's the origin of it, is, 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 um, is gambling. And so here we are, we're used to these food bars and things like this that you can stick in your car, on the go, KFC. Uh, and it's sort of for a different kind of addiction. It's addiction for sort of our daily lives of modern life. And I think, to me, what has happened is food companies have gotten very, very good at making things really convenient for us, but not necessarily making healthy things convenient for us. So the last point here is that on uh, meals at home have been declining. Uh, they've been increasing. This is a pretty st steady trend throughout the US, but you can look globally and see pretty similar numbers. Uh, but I think one thing that's happening, one thing that's going to start to change some of this, is the ability to do really good cooking at home in almost mind-numbingly simple ways. Uh, so my favorite example of this is something called Nomiku. Uh, but they're, they're, they're one of several companies that have started to create these. Uh, that machine there is essentially a very, very precise uh, immersion heater that you stick into food. And what it does is it allows you to do sous vide cooking at home. Now, if you don't know what sous vide cooking is, uh, it sort of originated in France, made its way over to Napa in something like the 60s or 70s. But the basic idea is to hold food at an extraordinarily precise temperature for a very long period of time. So you'd cook something for like a day or two. And the people who do this and know how to do it really well, uh, they can charge you $500 to go to their restaurant for dinner. This is, you know, fanciest, highest end cuisine in the world. Uh, this Nomiku device is something like $200, maybe it's $180, it's something in that neighborhood. Uh, it works almost as well as the materials, as the devices that these highest end chefs use. And what it's effectively doing is democratizing and making it just almost as easy to do sous vide cooking as it is to do microwave cooking. It's just instead of getting microwave quality food, you can potentially get very high end quality food. So, for me, I think that's a really interesting sign that we might start doing at least some more preparation at home. Um, this is also interesting in the space of knowing more about what we have. So um, we're going to have much greater, so this is something called Telspec, and really it's an ability to get very precise nutritional information out of what we put into our bodies. 
Um, so again, looking sort of at what we might imagine a world to be, is we might see a world where you'd have something like sensors telling us how the quality of food is in our house, and tools like Nomiku to make it easier to cook. And you'd get this world here where you'd see an app or, or sort of a phone interface saying, you know, this tomato today is perfect for salad, but if you're not in the mood for salad, just make me for pasta tomorrow when I'll be perfect for pasta. Um, but it's a world where we're going to start to have these kinds of very precise metrics about taste, quality, and so on, and use them to really sort of guide how we go about producing food or consuming food. Uh, finally, the last kind of big disruption here is kind of augmenting mindful eating. So this is sort of the standard, particularly, in, and again, in, in San Francisco, this is pretty much the standard when you look around and see people out to dinner, you see couples texting who knows who, but not interacting with each other, just kind of mindlessly looking at their phones. Um, the situation is so bad that a couple years ago, uh, Nestle, as a joke, created a free no Wi-Fi zone. Uh, the idea was that within a five square meter radius, or you know, whatever the exact uh, five meter radius, no Wi-Fi, no, you know, no, no signal could get through, so that you could just take a break from the internet, and hopefully, and hopefully for them, eat a Kit Kat. Whether or not you ate a Kit Kat, it was the idea was just take a break, be mindful. Uh, so I think that that's pretty interesting. Uh, but for me, it's also interesting to think about how do we use kind of digital technologies to help us focus around food and also help augment the experience of food. Um, actually, I'll get to that in one second, but there's this kind of one sort of final point here, which is the emergence of, of edible schoolyards. And this is something that's happened all over the world, but it's really creating this generational shift that I think it's very fair to say that uh, my, my daughter, who's one and a half, will know a lot more about agriculture at a visceral level than I ever will, just because of sh that's being so integrated into the school curriculum. And I think that that's something that's happening globally. And so we're kind of moving in this world where I think there are going to be different sort of fragmentations of, of, of expertise, knowledge, and interactions, and expectations of sort of authenticity around food. But finally, this is what we might imagine a world of sort of augmented by digital, but also meant to be mindful food looking like. Uh, I do a fair amount of flying for work. Um, and one of the things that, as a general rule, you'll find is that eating a meal on a plane, even if the food is actually pretty good, the experience is really pretty terrible because you know, you're by a bathroom, there are you know, kids making noise, you know, it's kind of unpleasant, it's cramped, whatever it might be. So this is a virtual reality headset. And the idea here is to imagine a world where on an airplane you get in and the virtual reality headset kind of puts you into the location that you're going or into a location that you want to be in where it has little, um, little nose uh, hooks or nose pads, I don't know what the word would be, but little things for your nose that sort of start to pipe in different scents so that you can smell things that kind of play music for you. But to really start to imagine the food experiences that you're designing from this perspective of sort of a multi-sensory world, uh, I think is a very interesting innovation space to be playing with. And one in many ways that's it's very old, but one that I think we're just sort of starting to get our heads around how to do well. So a couple key insights, and I have some sort of broader kind of general lessons, I think, from Futures work that I'll share briefly. Uh, one is I think we're seeing a potential generational shift around not nutrition knowledge and food preference, that, um, that, that we should expect and anticipate that our kids, our teenagers, and our 20-somethings will be far more engaged and invested in the origin and the story and the sustainability around foods. And that's really going to shift a lot of demands in interesting ways. Um, I think, again, new kitchen appliances are going to lower skill barriers around cooking, that one of the things that's happened over the last 50 to 75 years is just a lot of basic kitchen skill has been lost as people do other things. And so I think what we're starting to see is the emergence of appliances and other tools at home that can make it much easier um, for you to do that. Uh, and then finally, I think in this world that if you're not convenient, if you're not making things easy for people, that's almost like that's where you have to start. That's not the value proposition. If you look at McDonald's sales in the United States, I think one of the reasons McDonald's sales have been plummeting is because they had a very, very well-established value proposition called convenience. And they thought that that was sustainable and defensible. And it was sustainable and defensible for 50, 60 years, but it just isn't anymore. And I don't think it's ever going to be defensible in the future. So if you think about this space, I think you have to think, how do, how do you start? You know, convenience is just a starting point. So just a last kind of couple lessons. 
Uh, just, you know, it's, uh, these events are so much fun and I, you know, just love the opportunity to get to kind of spend time with people and, and take a step back and say, what are the big ideas? What are the big things that are changing? Uh, but the big lesson, this is an um, image from the 1939 World's uh, Fair. At the time, General Motors put on this Futurama exhibit. And if you went into the Futurama exhibit, you got a little pin that said, I have seen the future as brought to you by General Motors. Um, and that was sort of the mind, you know, that, that, that was kind of an interesting mindset, but it was in many ways the mindset of the time, that the future was something that was handed down to you from the world's largest manufacturer of automobiles. Uh, so a few years ago, we did this. Uh, we changed this idea toward, I am making the future, and sort of thinking about, what if, you, what if that was our investment? What if that was how we thought about this kind of a, a, a session? So a few just suggestions, or a few ideas about how you can get started to take this back to your team. Uh, one is the look for opportunities to create commons between different organizations. And I think this event uh, is a really good example of a very simple kind of commons-based activity, that is, of putting information and bringing stakeholders together in a room and saying, let's share and interact rather than be siloed and private. Uh, what's pictured there is work, the Cacao Genome Database that's being done by Mars, where they said, you know, there are some serious risks that the cocoa plant will go away. So we've sequenced the genome, and rather than hold it, we're just going to put it out in the world, because we'd rather have lots of people looking at this problem than nobody looking at this problem. And we'd rather have a portion of a big market than a market going away. Uh, Sam, um, Samuel Adams' parent company, Boston Brewing Company, did the same thing during a hop shortage of 2007 and 2008. They put a bunch of their hops up for wholesale um, out to the world, essentially saying, uh, we'd rather continue to grow this category than watch the category die because our, our competitors can't afford hops. So that's one approach. Um, a second is simulate possibilities. And, and one of the reasons I said I don't like to start this, or I don't like the word prediction, is I think one of the roles of thinking big and thinking long term is to give yourself space to say, I might not be right about this, but let me play with this idea. Or this might not happen, but if it happens, it's going to be a really big problem. So I should at least be prepared for it, because there's you know, a 10 20% chance it could happen. So this is uh, Chris Hadfield, the Canadian astronaut who got famous for doing the space oddity cover uh, when he was in space. And he wrote this really fantastic memoir. So just a couple quotes that I like from it is, we're trained to look on the dark side and imagine the worst things that could ha possibly happen. This is about being an astronaut. In simulators, one of the most common questions we learn to ask ourselves is, OK, what's the next thing that could kill me? But the result of that is this, that when we got back to Earth, a lot of people asked whether everything had gone the way we'd planned. The truth is that nothing went as we'd planned, but everything was in the scope of what we prepared for. I think that's an important mindset shift to make. If you can prepare for a lot of different things, you can give yourself space to be much more flexible and much more active. Uh, flipping dilemmas and challenges, I think this is some, some work from Walmart. They've done a really good job of recognizing that inefficiencies in their system were not only creating costs, uh, but were creating branding problems for them. So they put a lot of upfront money into saying, let's be more sustainable, uh, we're better for the environment, and by the way, this will help us with, at the time, a very big brand image problem that they were having in the United States. So it's just a way of thinking about if we can sort of invest and sort of flip this challenge, I think it's a really, there are big opportunities there. And then finally, I think this is the big, you know, if there's one big lesson of Silicon Valley and the way Silicon Valley innovation happens, it's that it's okay to fail. That's a hard thing to say in most organizations. It's a hard thing to swallow in most organizations. Nobody wants to be the owner of a failed project. Um, but the way that you own a failed, pro failed project is you do something small and you test it and you learn from it. That's why I said experiment to learn here. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was working with a research group in North Carolina in the United States. And I asked, you know, what's something simple you did that had a big impact? And a senior researcher there paused and she thought and said, I made a phone call to somebody whose article I liked. And then we decided to have lunch. And since then, we've gone on to collaborate on $10 million of research projects. Now, she didn't have the $10 million multi-year collaboration in mind. She just wanted to talk to this person about their research. But that's a simple experiment, right? It's very simple to call somebody or to send them an email. But I think one thing, that if you take one thing away from this kind of a session is that it's very easy to get overwhelmed by big ideas. 
And the big idea here is to start small, smart, start simple, and learn and experiment and see what you can do. Uh, so finally, this is me. This is where to find me in the world. Uh, one of our past presidents said this about technology, which is that we tend to overestimate the impacts of technology in the short run and underestimate the impacts in the long run. The good news about that is that if you give yourself time to look ahead, it means, and, and you're patient, it means that you can set yourself up to really engage with this world in a meaningful way. So I, I think it's a, just a good sort of lesson to take away for thinking about the future of food and technology. And with that, I will thank you for your time.